My name is Elisabeth Hagert and I'm a hand surgeon practicing in Stockholm, Sweden. I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to be part of the EFSHT Online 2020. I would like to talk to you today about the basic science of proprioception and the neuromuscular control as it relates to the basal thumb joint. Well, we all know that with regard to basal thumb arthritis, when you have an end stage osteoarthritis, you will have very severe cartilage degeneration. Quite a few of us are also taught that osteoarthritis may be the result from abnormal mechanical stresses on the joint, in this case, the basal thumb. However, recent science has shown that the loads on a joint with osteoarthritis are most likely normal, whereas the biomaterials around the joint are abnormal. So it means that instead of just looking at the joint and instead of just looking at cartilage, we should look at a joint as a synovial organ, where any part of that joint may contribute to the development of osteoarthritis. So let's look at the basal thumb joint as a synovial organ. In this instance, the synovial organ pertains to the bone and the cartilage of the trapezium metacarpal joint to the synovium lining the joint and the ligaments stabilizing the trapezium metacarpal joint. It also pertains to the muscles controlling the basal thumb, but not least the innovation and proprioception of the joint. Proprioception really means the sense of our self. Proprioception was first defined by Sir Charles Scott Sherrington in 1906 as the conscious and unconscious perception and regulation of posture and motion through stimuli originating from receptors in skin, joints and muscles. Well, with regard to the wrist joint, several studies have been conducted in the past decade. So if we look at the wrist joint, we know that we have sensory nerve endings in the wrist that signal from the wrist joint to the spinal cord. These afferent signals in turn create ligament and muscular reflex arcs that control the muscles around the wrist joint. We also have signals that go to the brain and the cerebellum for higher supraspinal control and for feed forward planning. But what about the basal thumb joint? And what about the basal thumb joint with regard to proprioception? Do we have nerve endings in the joint capsule and the ligaments? Are there ligament and muscular reflexes? How is the muscle control of the basal thumb? And what types of changes may we see in osteoarthritis? And finally, what does all of this mean with regard to the clinical implications? Well, let's start by looking at the nerve endings in the basal thumb joint capsule and ligaments. The nerve supply of the trapezium metacarpal joint has been extensively studied by Loria and Poupon, and their studies from 20 years ago hold true still today. What we find is that with regard to the basal thumb joint, we have innovation from the median nerve and the palmar cutaneous branches. We have innovation from the lateral antebrachial cutaneous nerve, but most of the innovation to the basal thumb joint comes from the sensory branch of the radial nerve. So we have innovation that goes to the capsule of the basal thumb joint, but also into the ligaments. And if we look closer, we find that the dorsal ligaments of the basal thumb joint have a rich innovation whereas the volar ligaments are poorly innovated. And if we look at the distribution of the innovation within the ligaments, we find that a significant portion of mechanoreceptors and nerve endings in the ligaments are found close to the metacarpal insertion, which is mobile, rather than into the more rigid trapezial insertion. The sensory nerve endings have been extensively studied by myself and also by my co-worker, Dr. Susanna Rain. These are the beautiful images that she has found. From the basal thumb joint, we find that we have Rufina receptors. These receptors are static. They signal joint positioning, 
than speed of movement. They are the most common receptor found in the basal thumb joint as well as in the wrist. The Pacini corpuscle, on the other hand, is another type of mechanoreceptor that is dynamic. It signals acceleration and deceleration of the joint. It's not very commonly found in the basal thumb, more so in the wrist ligaments. Finally, we have ample free nerve endings. The free nerve endings are nociceptive nerve fibers and one of the most common receptor types found in the basal thumb. So looking at the innovation, we realize that the CMC1 joint has proprioceptive potential. The dorsal, but not the volar CMC ligaments are richly innovated with mechanoreceptors and that the majority of innovation is found in the more mobile metacarpal region rather than the rigid trapezial insertion. So we know that we have nerve endings, but the question is, do these nerve endings signal to the muscles around the joint? Dr. Natalie Mombarga had this as part of her PhD thesis, the study of ligament and muscular reflexes in the basal thumb joint. In fact, the first study was conducted on her own basal thumb. It all really started by looking at Hilton's law. Dr. John Hilton provided a a number of anatomical studies and presentations in 1860 to 1862. And what Hilton's law states is that any nerve supplying the muscles extending directly across and acting at a given joint will not only supply the muscle, but also innervate the joint and the skin overlying the muscle. So if we were looking at Hilton's thumb, we should really look at the dorsal radial ligament of the basal thumb joint. So in the, our study, we enrolled 10 healthy participants, five women and five men with a mean age of 28. None of them had had a previous hand or thumb trauma. And by using ultrasound, we could insert a needle electrode into the dorsal radial ligament of the basal thumb joint we also inserted intramuscular EMG electrodes into two extrinsic muscles, the APL and the EPL, as well as two intrinsics, the first dorsal interosseous and the APB. If we look at the results, we find that within 20 to 250 milliseconds of stimulating the dorsal radial ligament, we could see changes in EMG patterns. In other words, we had ligament and muscular reflexes. If we performed the tip pinch, we found a mass inhibition that occurred in every single muscle study. In other words, we have a joint protective reflex. Furthermore, the APL was the only muscle that reacted within 20 milliseconds. And we found that there is a DRL and an APL reflex loop for fast control that was both inhibitory and excitatory. So the DRL is of primary importance, both with regard to CMC stability, but also with regard to proprioception. The DRL is the stoutest, it is the most richly innovated of all of the thumb ligaments, and it also has ligament to muscular reflexes. Remember Hilton's law and Hilton's thumb, that any nerve innervating a joint will also innervate the muscles moving the joint. Well, the radial nerve, innervates the basal thumb joint and the dorsal radial ligament through the sensory, sensory branch of the radial nerve, and the APL is also innervated by the radial nerve. So we have a DRL and an APL reflex loop for fast control for joint protective reflexes that are both inhibitory and excitatory. So we know that there is connection between the ligaments and the muscles of the basal thumb. But the question is, how do the muscles control the joint? And are there any muscles that can actually stabilize the joint, whereas mus other muscles might destabilize the joint? Well, to study this further, we partnered up with our dear friends in Barcelona, Dr. Marc Garcia Elias, Dr. Maria Esplugas, and Dr. Alex Yuk. We used 10 cadaver hands without osteoarthritis of the basal thumb. We 
Place the thumb in a jig for load and orientation. And by positioning the thumb in eight different positions and testing all of the extrinsics controlling the thumb, as well as all of the intrinsics controlling the thumb, by using isometric loading, we could find that in all of the thumb positions, the first dorsal interosseous was the primary muscle to reduce dorsal radial subluxation. So by pulling on the first dorsal, first dorsal interosseous muscle, you can see the first metacarpal being repositioned into the trapezium metacarpal joint. Contrarily, in all thumb positions, the APL was the primary muscle to induce a dorsal radial subluxation. So the first dorsal interosseous should be seen as a stabilizer of the trapezium metacarpal or basal thumb joint whereas the APL should be seen as a destabilizer. But are there any changes in osteoarthritic patients that we don't see in patients without osteoarthritis? Well, if we look at the basal thumb ligaments from patients with painful osteoarthritis, stage two to four as defined by Eaton, we find that these patients have significantly altered innovation patterns. So rather than having highly developed mechanoreceptors, such as the Ruffini receptors, signaling joint position and the speed of movement, we find a predominance of pain fibers. And if we look closer at the synovium from patients with painful basal thumb osteoarthritis, we find a polymodal neurogenic inflammation pattern. So polymodal truly means that there are so many different aspects of inflammation that is going on, which in turn might explain why it is to, so difficult to treat these patients conservatively. A similar pattern of loss of highly developed mechanoreceptors, such as the Ruffini receptors, has been found in hip osteoarthritis where you have a loss of mechanoreceptors and more pain fibers. But the question truly is, is it the loss of mechanoreceptors that is causing osteoarthritis, or is it the osteoarthritis that is causing a loss of mechanoreceptors? What was first, the hen or the egg? So finally, let's look at the clinical implications with regard to basal thumb proprioception. Well, when it comes to rehabilitation, we realize with a thumb that is so highly proprioceptive, it is important to incorporate neuromuscular re-education as part of the treatment of our patients with early osteoarthritis. This is the therapy protocol that I published in 2010 with regard to wrist proprioception, and the same stages hold true for basal thumb. But if we look at the exercises of the basal thumb joint, there was a wonderful study published by O'Brien in 2013, and what they could show is that if you follow a neuromuscular re-education approach to the basal thumb osteoarthritic patient, you will have a reduction in pain and disability. Some of the exercises that are important to incorporate are those that promote the first dorsal interosseous, remember the muscle that is a, an important stabilizer to the basal thumb. So if you have a patient practicing making a C, that will put your thumb in a good posture, as well as pushing the index finger out to the side to tighten the first dorsal interosseous. But I would like to share a video with you that I recorded when I visited Anne Wagen, a wonderful hand therapist in Sydney, Australia, that I'm sure mo many of you know. So I keep thinking of my joint position sense by trying to keep my thumb on the line, but my index finger has to do this to maneuver the ball. Yeah. So, and I should try and stop that from collapsing. <laughs> So there's a bit of motor control, there's first dorsal interosseus, working on my APB and my opponents, 
So I love this exercise and, for, and I'll often mark the tennis ball and tell people to do two laps. Oh yes. And they always have to go in that direction rather than that direction. But I think it's helpful because they're using their first dorsal interossei at the same time. I think that's perfect. That's a great um, exercise. And then for others, if that's way too complicated, you can just get them to manoeuvre the ball like that. You see, so the index finger's really trying to do that. And once again, you're coming into more... It's the same exercise, really, but it's a little bit more functional. Yes. So the tennis ball exercise, so easy to do, uh, for the patient, both in clinic and at home. With regard to surgery, I, can, um, I am a hand surgeon, so I always have to think about how surgery in, can be affected. Um, well, when it comes to the basal thumb, we really need to look at doing nerve sparing surgical approaches if we have a patient with normal or, or early osteoarthritic joints. One way to do a nerve sparing bearing surgical approach is to use arthroscopic techniques because these techniques will cause very little denervation of the joint and the ligaments. And if you need to do any sort of invasive treatment, you should try to do arthroscopic synovectomies. And since patients with more severe osteoarthritis only have pain fibers and no highly functioning mechanoreceptors of the basal thumb ligaments, you can also consider doing a denovation or a shrinkage, tightening up those dorsal radial ligaments. So I would like to thank the organizing committee once again for letting me be part of this wonderful online session. And remember, proprioception truly is an important part of the basal thumb joint. Thank you very much.